time. Thanks for tuning in. If you are new here, we'd love for you to take some time and do this. Text the word new to 23101. That's the word new to 23101. We want to give you a gift, a $5 Starbucks gift card. And you're free to use that card however you want. Personally, I'd get an Americano and those little egg bites that are so good. That just about cover it. But you can do whatever you want. Text new to 23101. We're going to send you that $5 gift card. And if it's maybe not your first time with us, you've been with us a few weeks, a few months, maybe even a few years, we want to invite you to the next move. And that's happening again on November 21st. That's a Saturday night. It's a way for you to get connected a little bit deeper with Church on the Move. It's hosted by our lead pastor, Whit George. And we would love for you to be a part of that. You can text the word NEW, I'm sorry, NEXT to 23101. That's the word NEXT to 23101 so you can get all the information about joining us for the next move. Also, when you came in today, you should have gotten one of these. It's a menu for what's going on here at Church on the Move in November. If you did not get one, you can get one on your way out. Please don't leave today without getting this. So many great things happening here today. A Brotherhood breakfast coming up on, on Friday, November 6th. Baptism weekend, next weekend. So many great things that you don't want to miss. You're going to want to be a part of. So pick up one of these things. One more thing before we get back into worship. Pastor Ethan Vance is in the house today. He's going to be bringing the word. I heard it last night, and it's amazing. So get ready for that. And as we jump back into worship, I want to share a verse with you. This is Romans 10, 13. It says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let that sink in for a second. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is ready to save us and do great things for us. 
Let's call upon his name. That's why we worship. Let's continue to do that together today as Micah sings. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship.
Where there is light, there is no darkness. We invite you in, we put you first. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We surrender ourselves to you, our plans, our wills. We love you, Lord. We're thankful for you. We worship you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said amen. One more time this morning. Can we give our God praise? He is good. We love you, Lord. Man, you guys sound great this morning. You can take a seat. Well, good morning, Church on the Move. How are we doing this morning? Hey, would you put your hands together and thank our team for leading us in worship today? Great job. Now, we're so glad that you're here. If you are new to Church on the Move, my name's Ethan. I'm one of the pastors around here, and I actually serve at Church on the Move Broken Arrow. And if you didn't know this, we are a family of churches. Uh, we're actually six different churches, four in the Tulsa area, and two in our correctional facilities with God behind bars. And uh, one of the great things that we get to do uh, as sort of, a, if you didn't know this, we kind of have a collaborative leadership model, which means that we kind of do everything together. Uh, we plan our messages together. We uh, develop ministries together. And one of the things that we do is we share our resources. Sources. And one of the ways that we do that every single year is through something called our Compassion Offering. And so I just asked if this morning, before we jump into the message, I could briefly talk about the Compassion Offering. Uh, because our Compassion Offering, if you didn't know, is the way we kind of end our year, every year, with generosity. And we live out one of our core values, which is to unleash compassion. We believe that when people live with an open heart and open hands, God can do amazing things in our cities and in our families. And so every year we give to make some really amazing projects possible all over the place. Well, this year, one of the big projects that we're giving toward is something really near and dear to my heart. We are moving our Church on the Move Broken Arrow campus into its first permanent facility. Come on, somebody. And, it, and so, um, so the only reason that I wanted to be with you this weekend is to take an offering for that. So if we could have every head, head bowed, every eye closed. Uh, we do give toward our compassion projects, and uh, we believe that by putting a permanent location in Broken Arrow, it's going to enable us to reach more people for Jesus than ever before. Now, if you didn't know much about uh, the church or where we're located, we will actually be moving into a building at 71st and Lynn Lane. This building was an old Sky Fitness building, and uh, we, we had been sort of feeling like this was the intersection in Broken Arrow that we wanted to be in. If you live in Broken Arrow, uh, first of all, why are you here and not at my church? That's my number one question for you. Uh, but it, you know that 71st and Lynn Lane is a really busy intersection. We really wanted to be there, but with the COVID situation and and uh, just some, a lot of uncertainty. We just pulled back from pursuing a building at all. But the, the door opened for uh, us to be in this building. In fact, the land management company contacted us and said, this building is about to go on the market. And we just thought of you guys before we put it up publicly. We couldn't think of anybody we'd rather have in that building than church on the move. And so we, uh, we looked at it. We did our due diligence. We believe it is our next home. And so we're going to begin raising money for that. The cool thing was I was spying on you guys last weekend as Pastor Witt announced the Compassion Initiative. And to hear you guys cheer for our church was one of the coolest things in the world for me because part of being a family of churches means that we believe in each other, we support each other, we take care of each other. And so the fact that you guys would be willing to give toward a church that's not gonna be your home church is absolutely amazing. It's why I love Church on the Move. It's why I'm so proud of you and proud of your generosity. So I just wanna challenge you to do this. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, take a second and we're gonna pray over our giving before we jump into the message, but I would just encourage you to do this. Don't sit this season out. You might be here and you might say, Ethan, I, we really don't have a lot of resources, a lot of extra to give. It's not about the amount we give with, it's about the heart that we live with. It's about the posture of our heart to say, God, what I have is yours. And it doesn't matter how much or how little it is, this is not a church project, this is a faith project project, and one of the best ways that God can move you forward in your relationship with him and in your faith is when you make a choice to be generous with what you have, not holding on to your generosity until you have what you wish you had. Does that make sense? We don't wait until we have so much that we just go, well, I have too much in my life. I'm going to start being generous. Start where you are, and you watch how God blesses you and meets you right where you are. It's one of the best faith-building things you can do is to say, okay, if this is what my church family is doing. The people that I follow Jesus with, if this is what we're doing, then I'm going to link arms with them and I'm going to be generous with them, believing that God's going to work in my life as I'm taking care of his kingdom. Do you believe it? All right, let's do this. Let's take a second. Let's pray. Hey, a couple, a couple thoughts for you. If, you're, if you haven't given with us before, 
Uh, there's a couple different ways we give around here. Uh, you can text the word GIVE to 23101. And if you'd like to give specifically to the Compassion Offering, just text the letters CO for Compassion, CO, to 23101. It'll, it'll send you a link. It's super safe, secure. It'll take you about a minute to walk through the steps, uh, and you can give that way. Uh, but as you're praying for, over this, if you haven't, maybe talk to your spouse about what you're going to give to the Compassion Offering. What we're doing uh, is we're believing to raise as much of the Compassion Offering before the end of the year as possible, because that allows us to run full speed after these projects, knowing what we have on hand to do these things. So uh, take, us, take some time this week if you haven't done it. Pray with your spouse. God, what would you have us give? And maybe if you haven't done that at all yet, let me just pray over you right now. Maybe reach over, grab your spouse's hand, and uh, let, me, let me pray over you as we jump into this project and as we go into our message. Lord, thank you for the chance that we have to be generous, the chance that we have to uh, do something bigger than ourselves. Because we're a part of a church that makes a big difference, we get to be a part of making an eternal impact. God, I pray for every person that's giving. Would you meet them where they are? Would you see their heart? Would you open up the windows of heaven and pour a blessing into their life that they can't contain because they've made the decision to put you first? And in everything we do, everything we give, we will be careful to give you the glory and the praise for all the good that's going to come out of it. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. All right, well, we are in the middle of our teaching series, Hope for Your Home. And today, specifically, I want to talk to you about how to get your hope back when you've lost it. There are a handful of things that kind of drop an atomic bomb on our families. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. We have precious brothers and sisters, families in our church. Maybe you're here this morning and you've experienced loss. Somebody that you thought was going to be there, they're not there. Maybe it was a spouse or a child. And you've experienced that tragedy, and it feels like there was a before and an after. There was life before that happened, and now there's life after. For many of our families, one of the most devastating events that we experience is divorce. And divorce, obviously, is more and more common than ever before. And I want to talk to you just for a little bit this morning about how to navigate those things. How do you navigate divorce, remarriage, loss? I want to tell you just a little bit of my story. In fact, I'll just kind of take 90 seconds and give you the cliff note version of my story. As I tell you this, I want you to hear this. Um, I want you to hear this with ears of grace. When we talk about divorce, especially in church, I'm a feeler. You need to know that about me. I'm very empathetic. So even when I said the word divorce, I can feel a hundred different feelings in the room right now. I can feel some of you who have been uh, divorced and, and the, the separation, the, the, the loss of that marriage was your fault. And you live with some guilt and you live with some shame. And even right now, your palms are getting a little sweaty and you're wondering, what does this church think of me? What is he about to say? Am I okay here? Is there going to be like a spotlight shining on me when I walk out of the service and everybody's going, ah, there they are. Ethan told us how to spot you and I found you. Sometimes that's how it feels. For others of us, we were the victim in the divorce. We were the one that was hurt. Maybe it wasn't even anything you did. There was nothing you could have done differently, but the marriage ended, and you're hoping that I preach fire and brimstone this morning, and you're thinking, Ethan, if you could just preach, you know, eternal damnation to my ex who's sitting on the other side of the room, that would be awesome. I'll give you their name if you want it. Like, you're just hoping that we get this fixed because there's a justice thing inside of you that says, this was wrong. We need to fix this. Others of you may be like me. Divorce impacted you because it was something that happened with your parents and it had some ripple effects into you and your marriage and your family. I was born in 1978. Can you believe that? 1978. I don't look it, I know. Uh, in Estes Park, Colorado, I was born a strapping, handsome young lad. And uh, the heavens parted. There were choirs of angels that sung August 10th. And... Uh, my, my parents, my, my mom was not a follower of Jesus. She wasn't, she wasn't saved. Her parents weren't saved. Um, but during just the first few years of my life, before I even knew what was happening, my, my mom uh, got saved. She gave her life to Christ, and everything kind of started to turn around. My biological dad did not get saved. And as a result of my mom getting saved, her parents getting saved, Jesus doing some really wonderful things in our family, uh, there was a, a divorce between my mom and my biological dad. I, never, uh, I, never, I have never known my biological dad. I always feel a little bit like the shark from Finding Nemo when I said that. I never knew my father. It's, it's like, I, but uh, that this, was, this was life for me. From the very earliest moments of my life, my family was marked by divorce. 
When I was two years old, my mom met an amazing man, and uh, he was a follower of Jesus. He had uh, a daughter, and my mom had a, do- a daughter and, and me, and so they blended families. They got married. We were like the Brady Bunch, you know, his, hers, and ours, and uh, they had two other daughters. So I have four sisters, and, uh, you know, pray, pray for your boy. It's a hard life. Uh, and we went through a, a really an amazing season of, honestly, more than a decade of following Jesus, loving Jesus, building this new family. And there's, there's so much joy, so many amazing memories that I have from growing up. And as I tell you what happened next, I want you to know uh, I love my parents. My parents and I have a great relationship today. Um, but when I was graduating high school and moving into college, they went through a separation that ended up in a divorce. And when they got divorced, uh, it caused a lot of anger for me, a lot of heartache for me. It caused me uh, to be bitter. It caused me to be, um, in some ways, fearful. In fact, research shows that the most devastating uh, effects of divorce aren't on kids when they're young. They're on kids when they're in their 20s because all of the things that happened with your parents start becoming demons that haunt you and you start having doubts about yourself. If my parents went through this, maybe I'll go through this. Who am I to think I'm going to make it if they didn't make it? And here was the really devastating thing for me, was that my parents had promised us as, as kids all growing up, um, and, and it was the result of, I think, some really good teaching, but they had promised us that mom and dad are together forever. They would tell us this over and over again. Mom and dad are together forever. We will never split up. You can count on me and mom being together forever until on a Tuesday it wasn't true anymore. Mom and I are, are, are getting a divorce. And I was so mad, I was so angry, and I walked away from my relationship with my parents for a pretty long season because I didn't know how to reconcile what I felt in my heart toward them before the divorce and after the divorce. And I wonder how many of you can relate. There was life before and then there was life after. There was life that started off so innocent and so full of hope and so full of life that turned so drastically and you have the same feelings. Now, while I was not the spouse getting divorced, I I think I had many of the same feelings. What happened? Where did we go wrong? Some guilt, some shame was part of it. My fault. What could I have done differently? And we live with these feelings of pain after these devastating, often life-altering events happen. And I think the question that we often have is, what does God think about me, number one? What do other people think about me, number two? And can I move forward? Is there any hope for me in the future? And so I came here today to tell you, spoiler alert, yes, there is hope for you in the future. If you're walking through a situation right now that feels devastating, it feels like you will never get past it, it feels like the grief will never subside, it feels like the pain will never go away, there is hope on the other side of it. And so the first thing that I want to tell you today is that God, his attitude and his posture toward you is not anger, it is not hostility, God loves you and God is in a good mood toward you even if you have let yourself down or you've hurt other people. Now there's always a process to walk through these things and so I want to talk to you today about a couple of ideas that I wish I had known when I walked through this that I think will help you today. And here's here's kind of the first idea. It's that God always makes places for his people to thrive and be loved. This is always God's best. This is always God's ideal. In fact, we see that from the very beginning of the pages of the Bible, God is making a place for his people to belong and to be loved. When God formed Adam and Eve, he didn't make disembodied spirits to worship him just in the spirit realm. He made physical people in a physical place to experience the depth and the richness of life, the senses, the smells, the sights, the beauty. He experienced, to to experience all of that, that was what God wanted for us. In fact, Eden, the garden where God created Adam and Eve, it means delight, it means beauty. Oh, the idea of God creating Adam and Eve in this was that they were created in the middle of bliss, They were created in the middle of the ultimate place, the place where there was no heartache, there was no pain. They got to experience the fullness of life. This is what God has always wanted for us. In fact, in Genesis chapter two, there's this great little uh, set of verses where God has created Adam, and Adam's just experiencing all the goodness of God, and then God looks at him, he goes, you're missing something. 
You're just, you just need somebody to experience this with, somebody to share this with. It's not good for you to be doing this on your own. So what does God do? God makes Eve. And this is what Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22 says. It says, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And there's this famous verse in fact, Jesus quotes this verse. The Apostle Paul quotes this verse. It describes the ultimate idea of marriage. He says, this is why a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Come on, best verse in the Bible, somebody. It's just, that's what it's that. This is God's picture for us. It's like Disney World for adults. It's like you just get to have this whole thing to yourself, and you just get to experience bliss with this person. It is absolutely perfect. In fact, when Adam sees Eve, it's the first poetry we get in the Bible. He just starts spitting rhymes. He just can't handle it. He's just like, this is the greatest thing ever. I thought Eden was great. I thought the animals were awesome. But she is everything that I've been missing. Oh, man, he's in love, and it's perfect. And it's amazing, and God describes it. They're naked. They feel no shame. I don't think any of us realize just how amazing that verse really is. Because we live in a world full of pain, full of shame, full of heartache, full of regret. Your, your soul does not yet know on this side of heaven. We get to experience a piece of it, a taste of it, the first fruits of it in our relationship with Jesus. New birth, forgiveness, redemption for our hearts. But there's coming a day when all of those things that are sad will be made untrue. And your soul will know what it's like to be naked and unashamed. This is where Adam and Eve were living absolute perfection. You know how many verses in the Bible they get to live in absolute perfection? You know how many verses there are? Zero. Zero. There's not a single verse between naked and unashamed and tempted and sinning. There's ne- chapter two ends, they're naked, they're unashamed. Chapter three, the serpent was more crafty than all the wild animals. He comes and he tempts them. There's no gap. And Adam and Eve experience what many of us experience in marriage. The ideal, the beauty, the wedding, the honeymoon, it starts, it begins, we're off on a trajectory that says this is going to be great, and then almost immediately we're met with the heartache and the pain of reality and the fact that we're not perfect, our spouse isn't perfect, and we're two sinners trying to make life work together, and very quickly we lose the varnish and the shine of the ideal. So here's the question. What does God think of Adam and Eve when this happens? And by inference, what does God think of you and me when we sin and when we lose the ideal? When the thing that we had been hoping for, the thing we had been dreaming for, we lose it. Maybe through circumstances of life that cause something tragic to happen. And that thing that we had is gone. Maybe through our own sin, our own hurt, our own pain, something we did to somebody else, it's gone. What does God think about us? I wonder for Adam and Eve if they felt like in that moment, boy, God sure gave us a great gift and we squandered it. We had kind of one shot and we blew it. We wasted the one shot that God gave us. And I wonder how many of us feel that about our life and our marriage. We had it. We had it good, Ethan. Oh, man. Those first couple years, those first couple months, man, but then... He did, then she did, then I did, then I left, then she hurt me, then they were gone. And I wonder if we feel like we squandered like sand through our fingers the one chance that God gave us. This is very much, I think, how Adam and Eve probably felt. But in God's response to Adam and Eve, we can read God's response to you and me. See, immediately after Adam and Eve's sin, God goes into protection mode and he starts taking care of Adam and Eve. It says that they covered themselves, they tried to cover themselves, and then God gave them a better covering. It wasn't his ultimate plan for them, it wasn't everything that he designed for them, it wouldn't be the ultimate uh, uh, healing for their soul and their heart that they would have, but God immediately goes into being their heavenly father and covering their shame and helping them move forward in life. It would be a hard life. He promised that it would, it, would, it would contain toil, it would contain strife, it would contain pain, but that he promised that he would be with them in that, in that journey. And immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve, God does something amazing. 
Immediately, he kicks into place the prophecies about the future coming Messiah. He immediately tells them, yes, this hurts. Yes, this is difficult, but this is not the end. There's something at work. I'm, I'm at work even when you can't see it. There's a work of redemption happening right now, even when you've lost the ideal. So here's the first thing that I want you to hear this morning. God, God's ideal for you, his, his, his hope for you is that you would have a place where you are loved and where you thrive. But you know as well as I do, we ruin that. We wreck those sandcastles. We tear them down. We put our own gods in the place of God. We, 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 we substitute what God wanted for us through our own efforts. And within we, when we realize they're empty, we wonder if there's any future. We wonder if we've wrecked it. But even when we lose the ideal, even when we lose the ideal, God's not done. In fact, all throughout the Bible, God is working to bring his people back home. He, he calls Abraham out and he says, oh, I'm gonna make a family out of you. And out of your family, there's gonna be a nation and that nation is gonna live in a promised land and this promised land is gonna be a picture of how, how good life can be when people follow me fully. But what does Israel do? Israel wrecks it. They follow God's and often they're removed from the promised land that God took them into in the first place. But God doesn't give up on them. God is so amazing. They're unfaithful. They follow other gods. For throughout the pages of the Old Testament, Israel is called like an adulterer, like running around with, with other women, like cheating on God. And what does God do? He woos them back. He brings them back home. He helps them get back to what they had lost. This is the nature of our God, always redeeming, always restoring. And at the end of the story, we see heaven crash to earth and we find Eden again. God restores all that was lost. In fact, Revelation says that he's the God. He's, this, is what, this is what he says. He, said, he, he stands at the end of Revelation. He says, behold, I am making all things new. This is what God does. Here's the picture of Eden. God did not put Adam and Eve in the ideal place in the Garden of Eden, uh, knowing that they would sin as some kind of cruel joke. Like, hey, you're gonna get to taste this, but it's only gonna be for a minute. Then you're just gonna get ripped out of your hands and you're gonna lose it. It's gonna break your heart. It's gonna be amazing. Watch this. It was not some cruel joke God was playing on Adam and Eve. He was doing it to give us a vivid picture that in spite of our sin, in spite of what we choose, God always has a desire and a heart toward us for our good and for our hope. So what do we do when we experience the things that rip that out of our hands? What do we do when we lose the ideal? Great question, I'm glad I pretended you asked. I wanted to give you three things this morning that you can do, these are three things I wish I knew that you can do wherever you're at. But here's what I want, here's what I want to say to those of you that would say this morning, Ethan, we're in a good place. We're, we're, we're in a season of joy. We're, 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 we're doing good, what do I do with this? I hope that this frames how we as followers of Jesus look at people when they struggle. And I hope that this helps you maybe help somebody else walk through a situation in their life where they're struggling and they've had a setback. And the first one is this, remember that everybody has storms. Remember everybody experiences storms. It's easy to look at somebody, in fact, this is how I felt about my parents when they went through divorce. You must not love Jesus. Everything that you said about following God, everything that you, you pretended to put him first, but you must not be doing that. You must not really love God, because if you could, how could this happen? This only happens to JV Christians. This doesn't happen to varsity Christians. This doesn't happen to people that really love God. This doesn't happen to people that have their act together and are doing everything right. I had an incredibly religious attitude toward my parents. I had, an, I had a heart full of judgment. I was angry, and I got bitter. Because I thought, if you're following God, nothing bad happens in your life. That's the way it works, right? In fact, in the Old Testament, when we see people experience storms, think of Jonah. Jonah experiences a storm because he's running from God. That's how it works, right? We, we hit a storm when we're running from God. Until you read through the rest of the Bible and you get to Acts chapter 27, and you find Paul over and over again getting shipwrecked and finding himself in the middle of a storm, not because he's running from God, but because he's running directly into the will of God and he still hits a storm. This is exactly what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter seven and verse 24. You know the parable? He talks about the parable of two houses. This is what he says. 
Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, he says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And this is who we want to be. Oh, man, that's who I wanted to be. This is, this is who I am. I'm this guy. I've got a great house, a great home, a great life. I can post it on Instagram. Oh, it's, it's awesome. There's no, nothing wrong with me. It's all good here. And then when my parents went through what they went through, you know what it felt like to me? It felt like you took away the ideal from me. You took away my chance to be this guy. And I was mad. But this is what Jesus says. The wise man builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew against that house, they beat against it, yet it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a crash. Jesus did not say, hey, if you put my words into practice, here's, here's what it's like. There's this guy, he built this house, and when he put these words into practice and he did these teachings, crazy thing, never had a storm. No, nothing, ever, nothing ever came. It was perfect. He had this perfect life, perfect wife. Everything was great, and it was all peaceful. No, he said, the guy did everything right and still went through a storm. The problem is, very, thank you, family, amen. They, the problem is, we think that the storm is a reflection of God's pleasure with us. And when the storm hits, very often we throw up our hands and go, well, hold on. I thought I was doing everything right. What gives? The solution is not whether or not you go through a storm. The, the, the issue is not whether or not you experience something difficult in this life. The, the question is, how will you handle it when it arrives? Many of us are so surprised by the storm that we didn't do anything to get ready for the fact that a storm was coming. Now, when we talk about the fact that everybody goes through storms, you can hear it one of two ways. You can hear it as a free pass. You can go, well, well, well preacher, if everybody goes through a storm, then it's no big deal if it happens in my life. I can kind of throw my marriage away. I can, I can kind of do whatever I want, and, and I can just kind of live my life, and uh, the storm, just, it doesn't matter. I can just do whatever I want. You can hear it that way, and a lot of people do. This is misusing the grace of God. When you just say, well, if a storm's going to happen anyway, then what does it matter what I do? What does it matter how I respond? Well, your response has everything to do with what happens after the storm. And when you, when you hear everybody, ha everybody goes through storms, you should hear it through these ears. If everybody goes through storms, then number one, it should shape how I see people going through a storm. I don't see people going through a storm as a subset of Christians. I don't see people that are going through a storm as somebody I avoid until the storm is passed, and then when everything's perfect again, we can be friends again. I see people going through a storm as a brother and sister in Christ who are in need of, other, of, of support and people to run into the storm with them and say, hey, we've got this. We will help you overcome the storm. It also tells me that if everybody experiences storms, then my attitude toward the storm is not just, hey, take me wherever you want to take me. My attitude toward the storm is I'm here to fight in the middle of the storm. Now, here's the challenge. Specifically when it comes to God's view of divorce, very often what we see is that because we've, we allow storms to do what they want to do instead of having any resistance to the storm, we're very quick to let the storm destroy something that could have been salvaged had we been willing to work. In 1969, Governor Ronald Reagan signed into law the first no-fault divorce in the state of California. He would later say it was his greatest political regret. No-fault divorce was brought into our, our society because fault-finding divorce was so nasty. People were fighting and lying about each other so that they could prove that they were right in the divorce so they could end the marriage. So no-fault divorce was thought to be a way to bring peace to divorce, but what it uh, put into our society instead was a whole range of people who were willing to let the storm destroy something that could have been saved if they had been willing to fight for it a little bit more. Now, I'm not here to make a political statement at all about fault divorce or no fault divorce, but what I, am, what I am here to tell you is that as a result, you can look at the research, half of our marriages end in divorce, and of people that are getting remarried, two-thirds of those marriages end in divorce, which tells me this. We're searching for something that doesn't show up 
We're getting married, we're hoping that this, that this new family brings me something I didn't have before and we're trying to allow it to be something in our life it was never intended to be and when it doesn't measure up to the ideal, we, we allow the storm to wreck it in our lives and we walk away from it. Is divorce okay with God? What does God think about divorce? Well, throughout the, throughout the pages of the Bible, it's addressed, and it's addressed over and over again. In fact, uh, it would be a whole message series that we could do just on this subject, but the heart of it is this. In Malachi chapter two, uh, it says that God hates divorce. But he says that it hates divorce because of what it does to your heart. And the instruction connected to what God says in Malachi is, God hates divorce, guard your heart. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew chapter 19 as he's talking about divorce. People are asking him the same question. Is it okay if we get divorced? Can I walk away from this? It's hard. We're in the middle of a storm. Can I walk away from this? And Jesus says, listen, the reason that God told Moses to allow there to be divorce is because there was a problem with your heart, not a problem with your home. And because your heart couldn't be reconciled, he said there's going to be times when you're going to need to walk away from this. So the first goal of a follower of Jesus is not to walk away from the marriage, but to allow Jesus to work in our heart to say, God, I don't know if I can save this, but you can have me. You can have all that I am. And here's the reality that we live in. There are going to be times where on this side of eternity there will be a death. There will be a death of a person and there will be a death of a relationship. And there are times, explicitly written in the Bible, explicitly instructed for us to follow, where it will be better for you to walk away from a relationship than it will be for you to keep the relationship. This is true of friendships, this is true of marriages. There are times when the most God-honoring thing you can do is draw a border and a boundary between you and another person. And I want you to hear this, especially for those of you that are in a very difficult situation right now or you've walked through a difficult situation. God does not expect you to continue to put yourself in a position where you're being abused, where you're being neglected, or where someone is continually continuing to cheat on you and run away from you and expecting to be able to come back to you. You are not a doormat. You are not worthless. You are not somebody else's thing to be abused or, 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 or whipped around like a rag. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. And the worth that Jesus has put in you sometimes means that there's a place that we need to draw a line. Now... I can get divorced. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, let me explain to you how this works. Uh, did you play cards when you were growing up? Uh, and, and when you played cards when you were growing up, now I hesitate to say this because I know the, the first image that's going to that's gonna pop into our head is the election coming up on Tuesday. God help us pray for your country. Okay, when you were playing cards when you were little, uh, maybe spades would be an example of this. Uh, there's always a trump card. Yes, there, I said it. I got in the room. It's not a political statement about it, it's just, I said it, okay. Here's, so here's, I brought with me the, the, maybe the most famous trump card, it's the, it's the ace of spades. Yes, you know, you're playing, the, you're playing spades, you've got this in your hand and you can't wait to play it, right? When you play this card, this is the, this is the gambler in the Old West movie, the end of the movie, oh, it's dramatic, he pulls this out, pa, he puts the card on the table, he wins the hand, right? Okay, the trump card beats every other card on the table, yes? Okay, this is the way it works as a follower of Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, we are commanded to love unconditionally. You are commanded to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to lay your life down for the sake of other people, to be sacrificial in the way that you give, to be sacrificial in the way that you love, to love your spouse when they're angry, to love your spouse when they're unlovable, to be giving, to be forgiving, to forgive again 70 times 7, over and over and over again, to give your life away for other people. But yet every follower of Jesus has a trump card. This is the way we're called to live. But in cases of abuse, abandonment, and adultery, you are always allowed to play the trump card and say, no more. There's a line here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to play this. This is true of friendships, this is true of business partnerships. It is always God-honoring if you, when you draw a boundary that keeps you safe and keeps the things of God protected in your life, you do not have to put your kids in a position where they are abused, where they are in danger of being hurt by somebody that you know is dangerous, but you're trying to love Jesus and love people, you do not have to put your kids in that situation. You can draw a boundary and play this card and say, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve God, this is the boundary that we're gonna have to have, there's gonna have to be a separation. Now here's this challenge. 
The second you know you have the trump card, you can't wait to play it. This is how cards work. Oh, I, I, I want to play this card. I want to play this card. Now, sometimes we play the card too soon and we ruin our hand. This is exactly the way it works with divorce. If the way that you view this card is you have it out and you have it ready to play on somebody all the time, you will end relationships without giving God an opportunity to work. You'll be looking for the chance. Oh, you said that you looked at me sideways. Boom, we're not talking. Oh, oh. You didn't make your bed, silent treatment. I'm gonna pout because you didn't do, you didn't notice what I did. We play this card too quickly because we feel self-justified. You did something wrong, so I'm gonna play the card. This is the way this ought to work for the follower of Jesus. This card ought to be kept under lock and key inside a briefcase, handcuffed to somebody's wrist. It ought to be like the nuclear launch codes. It takes two people to turn the key, and you better make sure you know what follows. Because there's gonna be pain when you play this card. There's gonna be complications, there's gonna be drama. So as followers of Jesus, we don't play this card the first opportunity we have to play it, we play this at the last possible moment. In fact, the nuclear launch codes take two people, yeah? I think the same thing should be true of this. Don't cut off a relationship without talking to somebody that you trust, somebody that's God-honoring, somebody that's safe, somebody you know loves Jesus, where you go, you know what, I'm gonna give them an opportunity to weigh in on this, what do you think? I think I need to draw a line here. What do you see? Because when you just, I listen, I have people that, that talk to me often that say, Ethan, will you pray for me? I'm gonna get a divorce. What they want is they want their pastor to say, you're doing the right thing, keep going, keep following Jesus. And my response is, I will pray for you. But I, I don't take that as approval for what you're doing. You need to talk to somebody. Would you give us a chance to talk to you before you make, this is a massive decision. Don't make it lightly. Here's the way that I say it. When it comes to our relationships, especially our marriages, I am looking for signs of life, not proof of death. If you're looking for proof of death, you'll find it. But if you're looking for signs of life, I also believe that you'll find it. Abuse, gang, is not the same as suffering. Listen, everybody suffers in marriage. Everybody suffers in marriage. Everybody suffers in marriage. You, he snores, you suffer. She's a backseat driver, you suffer. Ladies, I don't know if you know this, but when, you, when you're a backseat driver, it actually causes snoring. So just, just keep, that in, keep that in mind. Listen, everybody suffered. I found this this week. This is, this, let, me, let me read this to you. I found this this week. This is a, 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 a thing somebody, one of my friends sent me. Go and put that next one up on the screen. So there's, 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 there's two kinds of people, the ones that pack six days before a trip, the ones that wake up day of and realize they need to do a load of laundry, and they marry each other. <laughs> Come on, we, we got to leave. What are you doing? I gotta just, I gotta just stick the stuff in the dishwasher, hon. We got a plane to catch. Let's... Don't mistake suffering as irreconcilable differences. Because very often through the suffering, God wants to do something in your life that he's never been able to do any other way. So here's the challenge. As followers of Jesus, here's what we do. When we understand that everybody experiences storms, we don't use them as a free pass, but we do this. We pray for miracles before we perform funerals. If your child is sick, you don't start building a casket. You hit your knees and you start praying. The same thing is true with your marriage. Don't put them in a body bag yet. Pray for them. Give God the opportunity to work. There are times when it will be the best thing to end the relationship but those should be rare, and we should fight. We should fight for what God has given us. Second thing that we do this, the second thing that we do is this, is we refocus on the future. This is really difficult to do. When you're in the middle of the situation, when you've lost the person, when the marriage is over, it's very difficult to, to move on to the future. And the tendency, depending on the way that you're wired and your personality, is you wanna be optimistic and you wanna to move to the future too fast. Let me give you some advice if that's how you're wired. That's how, I, that's how I am wired. If you're wired to be an optimist, allow the grieving process to happen in a healthy way. If you're a pessimist, don't allow yourself to wallow in the grief and the recovery process so long that you never move forward. This is the way the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter three, I love these verses. He says this, he says, of course, my friends, I don't really think that I've already won 
This is the Apostle Paul talking. He said, don't, one translation says, I don't think I've already arrived. I don't have it all together. There's still a lot of this that I have to figure out. I'm being persecuted. I'm thrown in prison. Listen, I'm trying to follow God. I'm trying to please God. He said, but in the middle of all of the storms and all of the tough things, he said, I do this one thing. I forget what is behind me, and I do my best to reach what is ahead. When you don't know what to do and you feel like you haven't arrived, there's always one thing that you can do. Do your best to lay to rest the mistakes, the regret, and the pain and move forward to the future. Do your best to lay to rest the bitterness and the anger that you feel toward the person that hurts you and move on to the future. This is how it worked for me. I played this card on my parents so quickly when they got divorced. I didn't know how to process it, and I didn't know what to do, so I played that card on them, and if I could go back and tell myself this, I would say, you were probably one of the few people that could help your parents move forward in a healthy way, but you walked out on them instead of loving them. Now, you will not always be the best person to walk hand in hand with somebody who's hurting, but you can always be the person that prays for them, the person that has a heart toward them, and the way that you know that you're starting to move into the future instead of holding on to the past is you move from blame to repentance. Blame was associated with the very first sin in the Garden of Eden. Adam looked at Eve, Eve looked at the serpent, they both looked at God and said, this is your fault, I don't know what to do with this. this is, and we were all blaming other people. When, you've, when you are ready to move to the future, you, your, your attitude moves from it's their fault, I can't stand them, I'm angry at them, to yes, it hurts when I think about them, it hurts when I think about that situation, but God, I'm turning to you. I need you to show up in my life. That's the moment that I can tell someone is ready to start taking steps into the future. Don't let your loss define you. Listen, you are not a divorcee. You went through a divorce, it is not who you are. You are not a widow, you are not a widower. You lost somebody that you love dearly, but that is not your identity. You are a son, you are a child of God. You were worth dying for, you were worth leaving heaven for. You are not defined by your loss. Don't let it define you and don't let it make you define somebody else to say this is who you are now. You're more than that. And the last thing is this. Refuse to go it alone. This is maybe the hardest one, but the most powerful one. The tendency, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, when you lose the ideal, is to hide. This is what Adam and Eve did. Yes, they hid. They hid from God. They hid from each other. How did they hide from each other? They sewed fig leaves together, and they covered themselves. When they covered themselves, what did they cover? They covered the parts of themselves that were the most different and the most sensitive. When you go through a loss, especially around the people of God, you feel very different and you feel very sensitive, and so the tendency is to hide. I've had friends who have walked away from their faith and walked away from their friends that were following Jesus because they felt so much shame and so much pain with what they had been through that they walked away. This is one of the great lies of the enemy, is that if you've failed, you should be on your own. You're not worthy to be around those other people. They have it all together. You're inferior. And one of the greatest tools the follower of Jesus has is to say, I refuse to do this alone. If you're in a situation where, you, listen, I want to speak directly to those of you that are contemplating divorce right now and your spouse doesn't even know it. Would you talk to somebody? Maybe the best thing you can do is open up to your spouse and just say, I am hurting right now. And I know that the second I bring this up, it's going to cause tension and it's going to cause arguments, but I just, can we talk? And would you give me grace to walk through this with me? When you make the decision that you're going to allow other people, listen, the church ought to be the group of people that put their arms around each other and go, you're not gonna do this alone because everything in our lives is defined by new life in Christ. When I see you, I don't see a death, I see a possible resurrection. I don't see the, I don't see the failures of your past as something that define you, I see potential in your future. And we ought to be the group of people that throw our arms open and around people who are struggling, people who are hurting, and say, you're not gonna go through this alone because we're gonna go through it with you, amen? And here's what I want you, here's what, here's what I, so, so what do I say, Ethan? What do I say to somebody who's in the middle of that? Here's, here's, here's what I would look at you in the eye this morning and tell you if I, if I could talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. God can do great things with wrong turns. Oh man, you feel, like you, you feel like you're on a detour, you feel like you're lost, God can do great things through wrong turns. I'll close with this. I love to sing. Many of you don't know this about me because I don't sing publicly. 
Uh, but I grew up in a very musical family. My dad is a drummer. My mom can play almost any musical instrument by ear. She's amazing, absolutely amazing. My four sisters, I have four sisters, they sing like angels. Well, three of them, one of them's not so good, but I won't tell you which one. <laughs> I didn't get any of the musical gene, none of it, none of it. But I love to sing. So if you see me, you know, driving down the street in my car, odds are I have my music up and I'm singing at the top of my lungs or rapping, depending on how thug I feel that day. And this is my life. But I have a few friends. They know I like to sing. And when I sing in front of them, in the past, they've made fun of me. You know how this is. It's like, oh, whoa, Ethan, what just came out of your mouth? That was not even English. I don't know what to do with that. Here's what I can tell you about those friends. I love them but I don't sing in front of them. You know why? Because I've done that and I know the way it feels. And so when I'm around them, I just kind of stuff that back down inside. Oh, but I have a few friends. They know I like to sing and they know I'm no good at it. And when I'm around them, they turn the music up. Probably so they can't hear me, right? <laughs> they turn it up and it draws a song out of me we live in a world that loves to stuff the song back down inside of us hmm. oh but the people of God friends you and me we should be the people that throw our arms open to people that are hurting struggling in pain and they've forgotten that they even like to sing. So much has happened, so much pain. It's just, life has just stuffed that song back down inside of them. And we should be the group of people that say, oh, there's more in you, sing with me. I know it's gonna be a broken tune at first. I know the words are gonna not come out right. I know you're gonna forget the lyrics, but you can still sing. God still has a song in you. There's still more for you to do. His purpose isn't ended. His call isn't forfeited on your life. There's more for you even when you've experienced pain and loss. And as the people of God, if you're doing great, you should be the person who's willing to put your faith on the front line for somebody else and say, you're with me. I know there's shame. I know there's guilt. But we're going to do this together. And together we're going to find the grace of God for the next season of your life. So, we're going to close our time together with worship. This is what I felt like God asked me to do, and so I'm going to be obedient. We're just going to spend a few minutes worshiping. We're going to sing this song. You're probably not going to know the words right at first. That's okay. This is a song drawn out of the Bible's vision of Eden restored. The Bible's picture of a God who makes all things new. And it's found largely from the writing of Isaiah. And so as I was praying about this weekend and I was asking God, what do you want me to say? He just said this, would you just close by letting me talk to him? Would you let me talk to him? So here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. Would you stand? We're gonna take the house lights down. We're just gonna create an atmosphere of worship. These are God's words for you. What does God see when there's failure? What does God see when there's pain? And what are we supposed to see in each other? It's found right here in Isaiah chapter 43. It says this. But now the Lord says, do not cling to the events of the past or dwell on what happened long ago. Watch for the new thing that I'm gonna do. Ethan, there's no new thing, watch. It's happening already. If you look, you can see it now. I will make a road through the wilderness for you. I will give you streams of water there. I will make rivers flow in the desert to give water to my chosen people. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers them no more. I am the Lord who created you. From the time you were born, I have helped you. Do not be afraid. You are my servant, my chosen people whom I love. 
I will give water to the thirsty land and make streams flow on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your children, my blessing on your descendants. They will thrive like well-watered grass and they will be like willows by streams of running water. Lord, I pray over your people this morning. I pray that they would find hope again. I pray that every broken marriage would find rest restoration. I pray for every husband who feels unloved that you would love them this morning. Every wife that feels lost in her own home, God, would you tell her that she is seen and she is loved. For every child that has experienced brokenness through their parents, would you give them faith that they don't have to continue that legacy, that you love them and you have a plan for them. For everyone who's experienced loss, the loss of a parent, a sibling, for those who have lost a child, would you remind us that you're the God who will wipe away every tear. One day we will see them again. We do not grieve as those who have no hope, but we grieve knowing that there's a day when that grief will be turned into joy. In your presence there will be fullness of joy and you will restore everything that is lost. God, we bring all of our broken things to you and for many of us they feel like dust, they feel like dry ground. God, would you rain on those would you bring water to our desert? And maybe just in this moment, even if we don't have the words to say it, would you cause the flowers to bloom again? Would you cause the green to break up through the concrete? And would there be signs of life? Signs that you're working. Signs that you're with us. In Jesus' name.
moment and pause right here because I believe Jesus is inviting you to just be with him. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. He is with you. Is there something maybe that came up in your heart or is there something that you're holding on to that you can just lay at his feet and trade it for his peace, trade it for his rest, for his joy. So whatever that is, maybe you're not sure what to say, just say his name, just say the name of Jesus. And just talk to him, he wants to hear from you. divorce doesn't personally hit home for you, but maybe disappointment does, maybe loss does. To be a little vulnerable with you, I personally have been chronically sick for three years and I know a little bit about, about disappointment and about loss. And I found that there is something about worshiping your way through, about singing your way through, because he meets you there. He always meets you there. And you get to know who he is there. You get to know his nature. You get to know his goodness. You get to know his love. And so whatever it is for you, we're gonna sing this bridge again. Let me just encourage you. Worship your way through it. Lift up your hands. Believe and sing in your disappointment. Lift up your hands. Believe and sing in your brokenness. Lift up your hands. Believe and sing. Lift up your hands. Believe and sing. Can we do that? Sing a hope in the Sing a broken mind. Stretch out your
grateful to be able to spend this time with you in Jesus' name. Today, I hope you heard the message that God wants to do something wonderful in your life. That all starts with a relationship with His Son, Jesus. And if you want to take a step towards Jesus today, we want to help you do that. When we close here in just a moment, if you'll just walk out any of these doors, there'll be a next step table with people who love you and are ready to lead you into a relationship with Jesus. Please. Don't miss this opportunity today to allow God to do something wonderful in your life through Jesus Christ. We also have a gift, a free gift we want to give you if you'll go by the next steps table on your way out. And if you're carrying a heavy burden today, if something's going on in your life, we would love to pray with you. We have a care center in our lobby. We invite you to go there. Let's be a family today, carry one another's burdens. Pray for one another this week. Let's go out with joy and excitement about how much our God loves us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go out, have a great week. God is with you. We love you. We'll see you next time.